Amen. All right. Turn in your Bible, please, to Philippians chapter 2. It's one of the greatest passages about Jesus anywhere. Of course, in the Bible, it's, it's, it's just the pinnacle of what Paul finally, once he came to know Jesus, the Lord kind of apprehended him, you know. And uh, so the Lord began to show him why he wasn't a false teacher, but he was, in fact, the Messiah, and you better get it right. And so he was, you know, knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus, and the Lord just, you know, poured out his spirit on, on Paul. So he began to write things in his ministry as they began to plant churches all over Europe and all over Asia and just so many different places. Let's, let's look at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 5. And he uses this passage to show not only how glorious and wonderful Jesus is. He's the wonder of the world. And not only is that brought to us, but he uses that to say, now this is how you need to live. He says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to hold on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And being found in appearance as a man, he became obedient even to the point of death. That the name of Jesus might be exalted and glorified. And that every tongue will conf confess that he is Lord. And every knee will bow, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth. Because God, therefore, has glorified him and made him the highest name of any, any human who's ever been. This is Jesus Christ. And so we want to talk about the greatest, most glorious person who has ever lived in the association of people. That's him. He's the greatest ever. You know, many people have sort of called themselves great. Like, I remember John Lennon. He used to say that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, being famous is not the same as being great. You can be famous and not be great. Just look at all of our politicians. <laughs> yeah, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm just saying all of them. But there's probably someone who's running for office in here that's amazing. But I don't know if you guys do that. But if you do, do it for Jesus, you know, for with all your heart. So, yeah, uh, Lennon, you say he's more famous than us. But 2,000 years after he's walking this earth, he's still more famous. And millions want to give their lives as a sacrifice for him. And then Muhammad Ali, remember, he would, he would always say, I am the greatest. But one day during his prime, Ali was about to take off on an airplane flight. And the stewardess reminded him to fasten his seatbelt. But Ali brashly responded, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and the lady stewardess she said, yeah, and Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> Fasten it, buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> and he did, which is good. And he was a very entertaining. These guys are entertaining people, but what does it mean to be great? And you know what? It's not only non-Christians that struggle with pride and and selfishness and those things, we as Christians st struggle with that. I do. I struggle with that. There's issues that come up. 
and I'm not showing the character of Christ that he wants us to show. So he's actually using this expression of how great Jesus is to show, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although existing in the form of God, he didn't regard that equality with God something to hold on to his, his uh, you know, opportunities as God. He took away those deifying things in order to become a man, but he was still God the whole while. In fact, it says, though he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God thing, a thing to hold on to is what the word is about, basically. That he didn't hold on to those things, but he let go and he became a servant, a bond servant. He was in the form of a servant, it says. And that word for form is a little bit different. It's the, the word schema, and it means when you're a servant, there's many things that you should be willing to do because you're a servant. Now, I know that in America... We, we, we don't think about, oh, yeah, I'm a servant, you know. But in the realm of God's kingdom, that's what we are. We're his servants, even though we're his sons and his daughters. And even though he said, no longer do I call you slaves, but friends. But we're still meant to be servants. To be servants for our Savior, our Lord. Just like Jesus became a bond servant for us. Think of that. That is just so amazing. Now, desiring to be great in God's sight is not wrong if we seek it in the right way. But what does Jesus say and what does the Bible say? He says, Matthew 23, 4, um, 11 and 12, he said, The greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself shall be humble, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted it's actually humble yourself in the sight of the lord and he will grant you this blessing and this encouragement but in mark 10 45 jesus said even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many i found that being a servant of god and i haven't always been a good servant but I found that if, if I understand that that's my lifestyle, that that's what he wants me to do, it's a fun life. Because he shocks you with stuff that he wants you to do to help people. And then people are drawn to the Lord, and they're blessed, and they're encouraged, and the Lord used you and me. We get to do and be his helpers, his servant. You know, no one in history humbled himself and served people more than Jesus. No one. No one humbled themselves. And yet he's the king of all kings. And the Lord of all lords, the Bible says. You know, there's no doubt that of all the people who have ever lived, there's no one that's accomplished more and done more for the glory of God and for helping others. He saved a whole world. But he had to go to the cross. He had to shed his blood. Because the devil, you see, had tempted Adam and Eve. And had said to, the serpent said to Eve, if you eat of this tree, you won't die. God said you would. You know, when God says something's wrong, don't do it. <laughs> don't you wish it was that easy? <laughs> you know, but then we do it and it hurts us. And it hurts the people that we're doing it with. It's really sad. It's heartbreaking. So the Lord wants to change that and he can change us on the inside and he can empower us to do what he wants that will please him. You know, Jesus, or actually, 
John the Baptist said, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. You know, John the Baptist was an amazing preacher. And he was an amazing servant of God. He was the cousin of Jesus. And God chose him to be the one to go before Jesus to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus was the one to her that was heralded by John. You need to listen to this guy. I baptize you in water. He baptizes you in total cleansing of your life and your heart. This is who John is. But John said, he must increase. You see, he said, I'm the best man at the wedding. You know, when we marry Jesus, John will be the best man. <laughs> but John said, I'm the best man, but Jesus is the groom. And all you believers in Jesus, you're part of the bride of Christ. Now it's it's marriage is such an amazing thing. And we have an example of it here on earth. Unfortunately, many of those examples are not very good. But thankfully God can help us to where our families become very important. It's through an act of amazing love that we even have children. You know. <laughs> I don't want to get too weird here. I'm checking on myself. Sometimes I go, okay, so I have, I have four children. And each of them married wonderful people. Um, wonderful Christians. Um, my daughter married a wonderful guy from this area. It's uh, Daniel Lafotu. He's a rapper. My daughter's a Christian rapper. But... Um, Anyway, and by the way, I used to hate rap, and now I love it. <laughs> I love it. Because it's so inspired when it's wholesome, but not when it's not. Okay, how did I get off on that tangent? Um, <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I would talk to my kids, especially the guys. I have three sons. And I would say, well, when are we going to have another grandchild? And they said, well, you just leave that to us, you know. <laughs> and I go, well, I, I go, you know how grandkids come, right? And it's really fun, so go for it. <laughs> just being weird, but try, trying to be couth at the same time. Anyway, he's the, the um, best man, but we get to be the bride. The bride of Jesus. So what I was saying about being the bride, I don't know what it's like to be the woman in the relationship. So I may not want to humble myself. Right? Uh, guys are, we, we might struggle more than gals. I'm not saying it's true, but we might. Right? So there's this thing that helps you want to humble yourself and actually serve. Because that's what a bond servant is. You know, it's interesting Something that Napoleon Bonaparte, if you can believe this, said. He was the great French conqueror and emperor. And he said these words. He said, I marvel that whereas the ambitious dreams of myself and Caesar Augustus and Alexander the Great, the things that we have done have vanished in thin air, whereas a Jewish peasant named Jesus has put forth his hands stretched at them across the destinies of men and women and have made their lives completely transformed. And this is what Bonaparte said. He said, I know men and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. This is one of the emperors of the, you know, of the past. And he says, between him, between Jesus and every other person in the world, there's no possible term of comparison with so-called great men. He said, what do those things that we did, what do they depend upon? They depend upon the power of force. 
But Jesus, he founded his emperor, empire upon love. And to this day, millions would die for him. And he's not even on the earth anymore. In Bonaparte's thinking, he's the greatest wonder of the world. And he said his empire was founded upon love. Do you know the Lord above all things? He wants us to care about people. You know, some of you, it wasn't that long ago before you were following Jesus. And now you are. Someone loved you enough to communicate that he loves you. And he wants to bless you. He has a blessed life that he wants to use you to care about others. You know, Jesus said to this, this Samaritan woman, it was just so immoral. She had had five husbands. The guy she's with, she's not her, it's not her husband. Jesus came and he came to the well and he said, could you, you know, drop your bucket and I can get some water? And she goes, well, why are you talking to me? Mostly people don't talk to me because, well, number one, men and women don't talk at the well. And number two, they, don't, they aren't meant to fraternize at all in this situation. And Jesus said, ma'am, you know, I've asked you for water. But if you'd asked me for water, I would give you overflowing, pure water water just like a spring a fountain would spring up in your own heart this is what it's like to follow the lord he his fountain of love and life and hope you know how the lord through paul again in first corinthians 13 13 he said faith hope and love these are the greatest things and the only things that will remain from this earth's life Faith, hope, and love, these will remain. But the greatest of these is love. But there's three things that we just can't live without. And one is love. Another one is hope. Faith, hope, and love. Hope. Now, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. So it starts with belief in Jesus. And that will turn into hope. You will have hope all of a sudden. You know, right now, we should be thinking about the hope of what our destiny is. There are many signs that indicate that he could be coming soon. He plans to come and get his bride. You remember when you were going to get married and you had a date of when you were going to get married, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I can wait now. I can be a good boy and wait. Now, I'm not saying it's hard. For some, it becomes harder. And, okay, I can do whatever I want now. No, because you will hurt. If you're, if you're not going to stay faithful now, what's going to keep you faithful when you're married? And these are things that hurt people. They hurt a family. And the Lord doesn't want that. He's got a better way of living. His way is good. Let this mind be in you that is on, in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, my fountain of living water is so great that it is meant to come down and water a little flower like you. We're not all that and more. We're something. We're something important for him. And it's fun to serve him. When you get to serve him, your days will be a blast because you'll start doing stuff he wants you to do. And I'm not talking about a job and all that. On your job, you can still follow the Lord and be a servant. No matter what you're doing work-wise or neighbor-wise or any of that, all of that can become a blast because the Lord is going to use you to tell other people who are going to have life-changing lives experiences and a new life from him this is what he wants because he is the only one who can give that living water now jesus 
is unique. He's the greatest wonder of the world. There's no one even close to him. But there are some, once they receive him and are empowered by the Holy Spirit, can become like him again. You know, we lost, we lost the Imago Dei when Adam and Eve fell. That image of God was tarnished. We still have that fallen nature. That's what's sad. And we didn't, we weren't good at, at, at taking care of what God said. I want you to take care of the earth. I want you to watch over the animals. Make sure they're getting their, their needs met, you know, and all this stuff. Even that is godly. And it's fun. But so is your neighbor. And, and so is that person on the job that just annoys the heck out of you. But when that changes, man, by them seeing that there's something about you that's different, they'll let you explain why it is different. Let me talk about Jesus because we need this mind in us. Okay, on the night that would lead to the betrayal of Jesus and all the trials, you know, he had something like six or seven trials through the night. He didn't get any sleep that night. Plus, he was beaten over and over again. And then they had the Last Supper. They were eating and celebrating the greatest feast of Israel, the Feast of the Passover. And it became what we call the Lord's Supper, which is um, us, you know, having communion with Jesus. And his, the cup, the grape juice, or the wine is his blood, representing his blood. And, and the cracker, or the little wafer, is, you know, the, the bread. He's the living bread that comes down from heaven. He satisfies your soul. No one else can do that. Even your spouse can't do that. Now your grandkids come close. Because <laughs> you don't have to take care of them all the time. But number two, you get to take care of them a little bit. And that's fun. They're, they're a blast to be with. But here's Jesus. So they just had the Lord's Supper. And he stands up and he starts taking off his outer garments. And then he gets a, a basin. He pours water into it and a, a cloth. And he's washing their feet. And you know, the disciples, when they first saw it, they're like, what is this? Wow, there were, but no one says anything, but they're kind of embarrassed. Have you ever gone through like a foot washing thing where you wanted to know what it was like and you, you tried it? Anyone do that? Ever do that? I've only done it a couple times. I hated it because I don't want people touching my toes, getting dirt off my toenails and stuff like that. That's weird. <laughs> now, I know for gals, it's not at all, but you have to go to the whatever the name of the person who does that. But anyway, Jesus did that for all his disciples. And they were like embarrassed. They didn't know what to say. So finally he comes to Peter, right? And he says, no way, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So he's like, hmm. And Peter said, Okay. Well, then wash not just my feet, but also my hands behind my ears. Give my head a shampoo. I want to be totally yours. Now, that was a good thought. But once you're cleansed by Jesus, by believing he died on the cross and shed his blood. You know, when he was speared near the heart region, outburst water and blood indicating that he had a broken heart he his heart just gave out and and this whole water and blood thing pictures what it says in the scriptures about him and he was willing to do that to die in our place so that our sins could be completely washed his blood washes us white as snow at the end of the the sermon, I want to give you an example of how much this costs Jesus. Because there's a prophecy about the Messiah. 
that I want you to see when we close, and we're getting close to that. So Jesus took the form of a bondservant and laid aside the exercise the exercise of his divine privileges. And he humbled himself. He became obedient to the Father's word to the point of dying on the cross. There are more prophecies about Jesus than any other um, person or nation or any of that in all the world. Most of the prophecies are all about the Messiah. And, and that's why I want to share with you one of the most important ones at the end, but he wants us to realize that he wants us to be pleasing. And he wants others to find out the gospel. And he's, he chooses to use his people who know the gospel and have been washed and have a relationship. How do you know for sure that you have the gospel, the real gospel? Because you're entering into a, a conversation and a experiential knowledge, which is the word gnosko, it means you're experiencing Jesus in your life. His spirit is touching your heart day by day. It's not just, oh, I know theology. No, you know a person. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life. What? To know God and Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. You literally will have a knowledge and an interaction between you and God. If you don't have that, you don't know him yet. And there needs to be a cleansing by his blood to remove those barriers. And they're free. It's all by grace. Listen to this verse. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's his gift. All you have to do is believe and receive. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are what? His workmanship. We're his workmanship. <laughs> He's making something amazing in you. And he wants you to experience that. We are his workmanship. You know what the Greek word is there? Poema. And it's the word from which we get in English, poem. You're a work of art, he's saying. You are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created by the Holy Spirit being given to us, being reborn spiritually. It's like a new birth, right? So you have this, this new spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. We are his workmanship. Listen to this. Created in Christ Jesus for good works that you may walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepares beforehand, he says. Do you know that, can you handle this? Do you realize that when you get up in the morning, he's got plans for you? He prepares beforehand many things that he wants you to do. And it all has to do with being a servant that's willing to share what you've been blessed with, with them. Prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I feel like I have one of the craziest and amazing agenda, I guess, that he has for me, I had no idea I would ever be a pastor. My dad was a raging alcoholic. I asked him one time, I said, Dad, can I pray with you to receive Jesus? He said, I've only met one Christian, it's your mom, so don't talk to me. I go, thanks, Dad. I love you too. But I truly did. But he didn't want to listen to me. He wanted to see it. And he said his mom, or not his mom, his wife, my mom. And she was the one that attracted him and he gave his life to Jesus. He died at age 52 of cancer. I'm 22 older than him than when he died. 
But he drank all the time and he smoked all the time and he died of lung cancer. You know, the things that the Lord says that you shouldn't do, don't do them. Don't do them. I'm not saying that we're all not going to die because we are. <laughs> we are. That's part of the fall. But we're also going to go into paradise and see Jesus and marry Jesus. Before he comes back for the millennial thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, where he's going to show, okay, this is how the kingdom of God should work on earth. That is going to be so fun. We get to help him rule and reign. I, you know, some people claim like Arlington for their jurisdiction. And I'm not claiming anything right now. Just whatever he wants me to do, because it's such a joy to serve him. But Jesus had to come down, down, down from being God. He never divested himself of his, his deity. He couldn't because he's God. Now, I suppose if you're God, you could say he could do anything. But that wasn't his purpose. He needed to be fully God in order to save the whole human race. Because think of this. If a person was a perfect person and someone needed to die for them. One person could die for them. But who can die for the whole human race? And it cleanses all people. It would be the God-man. It took the God-man to save every person that needed forgiveness. And you're one of those that he's given that to. And he, or if you don't feel he has yet, he will and he wants to. It's up to you now. We need to receive because he loves us. Now, the Lord was so pleased with what Jesus chose. And that was to serve his world. God's world that he had made and his world of humans and angels, and all the others. He has plans for all of them. But he wanted us to live for him and to serve him. And Jesus did. Remember, he prayed in the garden, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. You know, sometimes we pray, don't let this go on anymore. But maybe it's what's supposed to happen. And I love how Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Your will be done. And because he did go through and do exactly what the Father wanted, and I'm going to explain to you from that prophecy when we get there. But when he did that, it opened salvation for every single person. You know, they say that from the outer edges of the universe to the across the, the universe, across the way, is 10 billion light years or 100 billion trillion miles long. But that distance is as nothing compared to how far Jesus came down to reach us. He came from heaven to earth. We have that song. He came from heaven to earth. I just love that. He came all the way down and he went and in a sense took hell. God being crucified. Think of that. Unbelievable. But then up from the grave he arose. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with you and I and his saints to reign. He has good plans and he wants us to serve because there's more people to glorify God with coming to him and finding salvation. Now, how do you know if you really have a, a servant's heart? Well, very simple. How do you react when people treat you like you are a servant? Like when people are kind of taking advantage of you in a certain way. Now, I'm not saying we should let people do that. If, Number one, if you're training kids, you shouldn't. Let them learn. Hey, come on now. We treat each other different here. And because we are servants, we keep loving no matter what. 
But if we're serving people and we're offering our lives to the Lord to show people that he's real, that is when you'll know. Now, are you going to be content if the people don't pat you on the back, but Jesus said, I like what you did there. That was great. I'm sorry that they wanted to spit on you. I'm sorry about that, but that happens. I had a lot of spit myself. Are we willing to not be exalted as long as the Lord's pleased? And the Lord's happy with what we're doing. He came in the form of God and that could never change. He will always be God. But on the other hand, as a servant, he's willing to do whatever a servant does. And you know what? Servants alone were those who washed feet. Other people didn't have to do it. Unless, like I said, they were part, part of the family. Now, just one last thing before we hit those scriptures I was telling you about. The devil tried to tempt Jesus not to go to the cross. And he said, Jesus, um, I hear that the Father wants you to go die on the cross and then you get to have the world back that those idiots believe my stupid serpent lies and they said you you've lost control of the world you don't take care of it like you should and I'm not talking about you know what do you call it when the sun's shining too much Global warming. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how we live and care about people. And the, one of the main things is helping to get them close to Jesus so they can know Jesus. Now, the devil tried to say, no, you don't have to do that. Remember when he took him up there on the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory? Yeah, glory. Oh, the U.S., you are so glorious. Cough, cough. Now, we're glad we have freedom, but sometimes our freedom is not showing the glory, if you know what I mean. So this is not about being the greatest nation in the world. Don't forget Napoleon Bonaparte. He was real about it. He knew what he was, and I hope he came to the Lord. But the devil said, all, all you have to do, you don't have to go to the cross. Now, don't go to the cross. Don't do that. Don't take up your cross and follow God. That's weird, taking up your cross. I like the one I have around my neck. It's fine. It's kind of cool, too. I got a diamond on there and a ruby. But you know what? The devil said, you don't need to do that. All you have to do is bow down to me. You just have to say, God bless you. Oh, praise the Lord for Satan. Just, just, just start worshiping me. I'll give you those kingdoms and then I'll, you know, I'll make it good otherwise. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I'm not going your way. He refused to take that temptation. And you know, it's interesting in Proverbs 18, 12. It says, before a bad downfall, the heart of man is haughty. But humility goes before honor. I love that. That is so good. Charles Spurgeon said, there are no crown wearers in heaven who were not cross bearers here below. Because that's part of our, our calling. We needed to apply the cross. Because he said when you eat of that selfish, the knowledge of evil thing, you will die. So dying to self by taking our cross and putting to death the carnal stuff, that's... That's our lifestyle. 
And, it, and you know, when you, when you realize that it means giving out the love, giving out the hope that we have, and giving out the faith, those three things that will remain. May, and it's the faith in Jesus that brings you right into the thick of what it is to know him in a relationship. Because his blood washes away the barrier, the sin. So I want you to turn for a minute, would you? Psalm 22, verse 6. Would you, would you turn in that? Psalm 22. You know, there are so many prophecies of the Messiah. And many of them are in Psalms. But in Psalms 2, you need to see this because it's so amazing. I can find my place. Okay, so look at Psalm 2. David wrote this psalm. Because listen to the first words of Psalm 2 and tell me if you've heard these words before. Look at Psalm 2, verse 1 says, or whoops, I blew that. It's Psalm 22. <laughs> okay, forgive me. Forgive me. Psalm 20. Psalm 22. Psalm 2 also is amazing about the second coming, by the way. You should go home and read that for the second coming because it's going to be crazy. All right, Psalm 2. Listen to this. Or Psalm 22, sorry. I know, I'm 74. Forget it. All right. Listen, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is David crying out like the Messiah would cry out when he's hanging on the cross. He's crying out to the Father. Why have you forsaken me? He was willing to become sin for us so that we wouldn't have to be slaves of sin anymore and so that we can know him in a closeness and care more about pleasing him than being whatever we want most in our human life. He says, why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my, and helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I am not silent. Remember Jesus died from when he took the cross at nine in the morning and then he breathed his last at 3 p.m. But during that period of time, it went from amazing light, high noon, and then it became all of a sudden dark. For three hours, it was completely dark. And here's the Messiah crying out and saying that very thing that was the reality that they saw. Now, it, go, it goes on. We're almost done. I cry in the daytime. You don't hear in the night season. I'm not silent. But you are holy. You who are enthroned on the praises, in the praises of Israel. So he's telling the Father, you're holy. It's not like he's saying the Lord blew it or something. He's his Father. He didn't want to die. He wanted to live. And he's now a man. He wants to keep living, right? But the Lord has plans, namely the resurrection. So look at this. He says, Verse 4, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and, and were delivered. They trusted in you and we're not ashamed. He's saying, why don't you do this with me? You know, kind of thing. But he's speaking as a man. He, he wants to live. But look at verse 6 now. He gives the reason. Jesus talking to himself and to the Trinity. But I am a worm. Did you know that the Messiah would be considered a worm? And I just want to say what one particular man spoke about um, the world in a certain way. He said, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll find it later. It's something like... Um, if it weren't for Jesus, we would be the worms of the planet Earth. And that the planet Earth is a very, well, 
wormy place. Let's put it that way. But let's, let's look at this last verse. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. Remember they did that while he was hanging on the cross? Shaking the head, saying he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb and made me trust. So he trusted from the minute, the second of the immaculate conception with Mary. And all through his life, he did exactly what the father wanted. He's our example. And he wants to show us how, what a blessing it is. And this is the main thing I wanted to end with. That word worm there in verse 6. It was the word tola. And it's what was used to make a dye. These, they were these wombs that would make crimson um, colored dye that was super high quality and they would recolor fabrics into the finest, most lovely clothes, as well as blankets and curtains they would use, namely curtains leading into the temple. And here's the clincher. Even what they would dye the veil that led into the Holy of Holies that completely would bring us into the presence of God. Like Isaiah said, come let's reason together, though your sins are as scarlet. This tola was a scarlet colored worm and it would make this dye make things beautiful. But with Jesus, his blood makes it more than beautiful. It makes it real. Though your sins are as scarlet, you shall become white as snow and warm as cleansed wool. It's kind of symbolic, the things that I'm trying to say. This is, these are some of the prophecies that God gave. And this is what he wants us to be like. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for these dear people, Lord. I thank you for their hunger and thirst to know you, number one, and then to learn more of you in your word and to read and to see what you planned way ahead of time, that you were willing to give up everything in order to become the savior of humans. Oh, Lord, we want to be a beautiful bride for you, Lord. We want to be a strong spouse that wants to spread your good news. Are you one who likes to share the good news? He wants you to share it every opportunity you get. Lord, I just pray that you will encourage people if you wouldn't mind, if you realize, I want a close, knowing God relationship with Jesus. I want that. And I don't have that. I want it. Just ask Jesus for it right now. Say, Jesus, come in. Fill me with your beautiful presence. Wash me white as snow. Lord, I believe you are listening and hearing and I want you to fill me with your spirit and make me a child of yours. And I ask this in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, he's answering. Stand right now, would you? All of us, and let's praise God with these songs as we close off our time today.